Okay, Craig, you can uh, you can get started. Well, good afternoon. First of all, thank you so much for having me and for uh, thinking about the Farm and Ranch Museum. That's that's a big part of my job is to um, is just spread the word and talk about the museum and all it has to offer and what an amazing place it is and and I enjoy doing that. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I don't know how is everyone pretty much familiar with the museum? I can go over sort of the basics or I might tell you something you don't know and hopefully I can do that and, and share some things with you. Um, the Farm and Ranch Museum, the, the, the beginnings of it really go back to the 1970s. And um, we had the Department of Agricultural, uh, Agriculture Secretary, uh, William Stevens and NMSU President, Dr. Gerald Thomas, we're talking about creating a agriculture museum for New Mexico way back in the 1970s. They were starting to see, Dr. Thomas was at Texas Tech for a while and he was seeing New Mexico artifacts in uh, Texas museums. And so that's when they decided to try to work towards this. Uh, as with anything with the government, uh, it takes a while. And they, uh, he was a lot of talking, of course, farmers and ranchers have their uh, input as well and, uh, and there's politicians, authors, scientists. So there's a lot of people uh, getting their input in. And uh, it wasn't until 1990 that the first legislation passed to start creating the, the board and the office. Uh, it's part of the Cultural Affairs Office at the time, which is now the Department of Cultural Affairs. So it's the only state museum in Las Cruces. And the only there's only one other one in Southern New Mexico, which is the Space History Museum in Alamogordo. So, it opened to the, they started building it um, 1996, 97. And uh, actually I think the, the, the groundbreaking was kind of interesting. They, uh, uh, instead of shovels, they had post hole diggers at the ground op at the groundbreaking. <laughs> so that was kind of nice. And that was in 1995. They started building it in 96 and 97, the main building. Uh, it opened to the public in 1998. Uh, big crowds, we had a big, big celebration then. And uh, over time, things have been added with uh, legislative appropriations. Uh, we've in 2000, around 2004, we added the horse and cattle barn and also the sheep and goat barn. Uh, the dairy barn has been there since almost the very beginning. Uh, and then we did the greenhouse in 2010. Uh, the historic green bridge was, uh, it's a big part of our, our museum really. Um, if you're not familiar, it was part of a three span bridge across the Pecos River near Roswell beginning in 1902 is when it was uh, constructed and put up. And uh, in the 1940s, uh, that bridge was dismantled and the span that we have now was moved to the Hondo Valley near uh, San Patricio, New Mexico, I guess. Um, and it was across the Rio Hondo there until the 1980s. They bypassed it with a highway bridge. It's a one lane bridge, obviously. And so it was just sitting there for uh, 20 years or 15 years or something, just sort of gradually deteriorating. And uh, the, the county commissioners for Lincoln County donated that bridge to the museum. So it was, since it's a historic structure, there was a lot of paperwork and a lot of work involved. It was dismantled and um, put back together at the Farm and Ranch Museum to go across the Arroyo, which came in very handy this past week and actually the past month or so with all the rains. Because we've, we've had some really nice uh, water come through there uh, lately. So it's, it's been, uh, it's our largest artifact, our largest donated artifact. And um, it adds to the, what I think is a tremendous skyline with the barns and the, the main building and stuff. So it's a really neat thing. That was 2007 when it opened. Um, let's see, we're on 47 acres. Uh, we're the only museum in this area that's accredited by the National uh, Alliance of Museums, which is the highest honor you can give museums. So uh, it's something we're very proud of. We had accreditors come and visit and spend several days there analyzing everything we do. So uh, we have livestock, as you probably all know. Um, do you all sort of live around the museum? I think some of you might. Is it sort of yeah, a Yeah, I, I live right behind it. And that, that rain that had occurred just uh, recently, it comes right behind my house. And so it came right through the farm and ranch too. Yeah, some of that water was, uh, 
most well, some of it was rain and the, it, it damaged yeah. the, the water main up the up the arroyo from us and so the city had to go repair the water main so some of it was from a pipe as well so when you combine the two it was pretty pretty rough oh but yeah on day, it was it was rough coming through us it was in the front page of the paper yesterday yeah we had to when we went to work i guess it was it was thursday or friday we had to go around and uh, come in through the cattle and uh, cross the bridge to get to the main building so occasionally we have to do that so but hopefully the animals are kind to you all and they're not too loud during weaning season and all that so <laughs> we have we have about a about a hundred animals close to it maybe uh, we have seven different breeds of beef cattle so we have angus uh, brangus charlay herford uh, longhorn and coriente and brahma so uh, we had one holstein cow we hope to get back into the milking uh, demonstrations but in the meantime we're uh, they're going to remodel the uh, dairy barn on the inside it's been the way it is since the museum opened 23 uh, years ago so they're going to do a lot of work inside the dairy barn in the coming months uh, mm -hmm. southwest dairy farmers uh, is is giving us not a, it's a donation i guess a, a sponsorship to redo the inside of that dairy barn. There'll be a lot more children's activities and make it, a, it's just gonna be a lot easier to get around in and look at and a little friendlier, not as dark. So um, we have two breeds of sheep and both of them have really strong connections to New Mexico. The first one is the Navajo Churro sheep. They're descendants from the first sheep brought by the Spanish in 1598 to Oñate's uh, expedition. And uh, so they've, you know, the Navajo really took to these sheep and it become a sacred sheep for them, for the meat and for the, the wool to, to weave and that kind of thing. So uh, we have a ram and three ewes and I hope we, we can get some more of those. And then we have uh, the Dibole sheep, which was a, a breed created in Southeastern New Mexico near Tatum, uh, New Mexico in the 1920s. And they crossbred two or three different breeds to get a, a big sturdy animal for that part of the country that uh, its wool is quite a bit different from the Navajo churro. Uh, the, the churro wool is just outstanding for weaving. This, this uh, Dibole wool is, is more for the lanolin and the products that come from that. It's, it's got a really sort of a greasy texture to it. Uh, so we, we we have a, a ram and again, three ewes there with that group. And we hope to have more sheep and goats in the future. And we have uh, ponies. We do the pony rides for the children whenever we're, uh, when we're not in a, a pandemic. So we hope to get that going again soon if things settle down. And then we have a couple of horses there as well. Uh, you all probably know about the main building. We have uh, Heart of the Desert gift shop and snack bar. And uh, they've had the contract, uh, Heart of the Desert, they're based in Alamogordo with a pistachio farm, uh, not to be confused with um, pistachio land or McGinn's, which is the other one, but they've had the contract for, for our gift shop for, I'd say probably 18 years or something like that. Stallman's had it before them. It goes out for a bit every three or four years. And then the, the catering contractor is Dickerson's Catering. And a lot of you might know Marcy and uh, they've been there for about 15 years. And that goes up for bid every four or five years or something. And, and they've had that as well. So um, what do you all think is the most photographed animal at the museum? I have some suggestions here. What do you think? The, long, the longhorn. Yeah. Well, the longhorns would be number two. Yeah. So it's it's the two great horned owls that roost above the, the rafters <laughs> by the front oh, door. Yeah. I've seen those. <laughs> yeah, the, the male has been with us for now at least 10 years. I want to say 12 or 13. But I, yeah, at least 12 years, maybe more than that. Uh, his, his mate back then uh, passed away. And so he's got a new mate now. Actually, she's been around for about five years. And so they they roost there. They have a nest somewhere. Uh, that I don't think it's on the museum property uh, or we would know about it, but we've also had barn owls uh, live there. We've had, had uh, bobcats that stick around quite a bit. Thankfully, they don't really mess with the animals. They, uh, they probably keep the mice and things down, but uh, they haven't messed with the animals at all. So uh, it's, it's a 
<laughs> there's a lot of animals around there and they're not all domestic farm animals either so yeah there's a lot of coyotes i see them <laughs> yeah they run through there casey that fence has, has really helped uh that they put the fence up about five years ago mm. yeah just it's a security thing it's mainly after centennial was built there was some concern that the students might sort of wander down there and you know get in the animal pens and that kind of thing but that's never been a problem uh, but it, it does help with security and uh, the wooden, you see the wooden ones now, the vertical uh, posts that are in the fences, that actually really helps. Uh, I know it blocks the vision when people drive in and out, but it, it really helps uh, secure the livestock from the coyotes as well. So that's part of the secu security there. So anyway, when you come in the main building, uh, to your left is going to be the uh, temporary gallery. Uh, it's the Legacy and Traditions Gallery. Sometimes we have two different exhibits there. Right now we have one main exhibit. And you've probably all heard about the exhibit. It's Home on the Range from Ranches to Rockets. And uh, it's a, the story of the Tularosa Basin in the 1940s and during World War II and the, the transformation that it made. Um, it's a story that's really uniquely New Mexico in, in a lot of ways, especially when you factor in the atomic uh, test in uh, 1945. And, you know, it's just a, it's a really an amazing, unique New Mexico story. And, you know, the Apache people were there long before these ranchers came in, but we had ranchers come in from uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s from mostly Texas that settled there. And it was during a wet, wet period in our, in our climate and there was grass there and it, it didn't last long. As a few years later, it started sort of disappearing. It got a lot drier, but they stayed there and, and toughed it out and that kind of thing. And then, you know, when the U.S. was drawn into World War II, uh, they had they needed land to practice bombing, missile testing, all these kinds of things. So, I mean, it's an obvious obvious place for that. And the ranchers were told it was they were going to have to leave until the for the duration of the war. Of course, it went beyond that uh, once they realized that uh, they stumbled onto some V two rocket technology that the Germans had, and they shipped them all to to this area to study them and test them and see. Uh, what they could do with it. And that was sort of the foundation, those V2 rockets of, of actually the space race and, and a, lot of, a lot of different things that went on after that. So it wasn't just a weapon for, for the United States. It showed a lot of other things they could do with, with that kind of thing. So uh, that exhibit, half of the gallery is for uh, the ranching side of the story and the other half is for the missile, military testing side. And it's not just, it's also the private sector. Uh, this, that's the birthplace of NASA, as, as many of you may know, and uh, a lot of private industry testing has gone on out there for, for science. It's just an amazing place when you think of, and the Space History Museum in Alamogordo uh, tells this story as well. So once you exit that gallery, uh, we have, some, we always have exhibits down the hallways. We have art show in the south hallway and in the north hallway right now we have our uh, gristmill exhibit and uh, gristmills of course go way way back and people have been grinding grain here for you know 4,000 years or so and um, once you go into our main gallery we start with early agriculture and one of the things that makes New Mexico so amazing is uh, the the depth of the history and the diversity of the history so we start with the the native people who are raising squash and bean and corns corn um Early on, and then when the, we sort of migrate, we have the pit house there. We have a nice big mural. We have some artifacts. Then you, we migrate to the uh, Spanish colonial period, which I said, like again, is 1598 when Oñate came with the expedition, and and they brought different grains and they brought different animals. Uh, they brought grapes. Uh, was the birth was the birthplace of wine in the United States here. Uh, they brought wheat. Uh, they brought goats and sheep and cattle and horses. So it. Uh, they brought a lot of resources with them, but they did not necessarily know how to grow things here. So it was one of the things that uh, the native people and the Spanish had in common is the will to survive. So when you look at it, they, the native people had the expertise in how to grow things here. And the Spanish brought in these different uh, products and commodities. So it didn't all always go well, obviously. We know it's a pretty rough history and uh, the anniversary of the Pueblo, Pueblo Revolt was last week. Uh, in 1680 when the when the Pueblo people uprised and uh, ran them out for a while and they eventually came back. 
but uh, and then later on we, we get into the, the territorial period and then the statehood period and around 1900 a little after 1909 1910 is when the uh, homestead homesteads really started taking place in eastern New Mexico and my great grandparents that's when they came over from Texas uh, in that part of the state you probably detect that accent a little bit and um, they homesteaded in eastern New Mexico and uh, many of the houses back then were uh, were half dugouts, and that's what my great grandparents had. Half of the house, I mean, it was there was so little wood and so little resources that they would just make half of the house pretty much underground, and it helped with the environment as well as far as heating and cooling and that kind of thing. So, um, looking ahead, we have uh, we can talk about things we have coming up in the future. Well, first of all, let me talk about our departments. We have. In my previous life, I was a sports writer and a news writer in the in the journalism field. And we, uh, if someone had a math question in the newsroom, you would get twenty blank stares because we were all journalism majors. And, <laughs> and I, when I started working at the Farm and Ranch Museum, it's really an interesting group of people because we have artists, we have people that can build things, we have cowboys, uh, we have people that do sort of what I do. And uh, it's just an interesting mix of people that have a lot of different skills and we all come from different backgrounds. So it's, it's kind of neat. We have a new director that started less than a year ago. Her name is Heather Reed and she comes to us. She's a native of Ohio and she comes to us from South Carolina where she was head of the South Carolina Historical Society and the museum they have there. And she's been here since November and uh, she's got a lot of enthusiasm and uh, we're really looking forward to what the future holds for us. And uh, she's got a lot of great ideas. I'm gonna talk about one of the exhibits we have coming up. Um, and it's, it was supposed to have opened last summer, but everything is of course pushed back. We worked, most of us worked from home for about a year. Uh, we had the livestock guys there and uh, the maintenance department taking care of everything. Uh, the rest of us are working from home and we really upped our social media and online presence during that time. We redid our website. So we were able to, to make a lot of progress, I think during that time, uh, even though we couldn't be on site and couldn't have visitors. So it was really tough on our volunteers because it's, we have an amazing group of volunteers and I'd, I would throw this out there. Anyone that would like to volunteer, just, just check us out. and. Uh, they're not quite back yet. Some of them started coming back last week and we, we answer to the state. And so uh, the state government is very strict with us since we're a, a state building, state facility, that kind of thing. So uh, we, they take their time getting us back on board. And, and so hopefully we can do that soon. But one of the exhibits I wanted to talk about is uh, the Billy the Kid exhibit. It's called Riding Herd with Billy the Kid, uh, the Rise of the Cattle Industry in New Mexico. And that's going to open hopefully in November, December, coming up this fall. And once we uh, we're, we're short a person, our, our exhibits fabricator, we have a position open. As soon as we get that position filled, uh, they can start building and they'll get that put up. It's going to be where the old generations exhibit was in the main gallery. And so we're looking forward to that. It's 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 not just about Billy the Kid. It's it's it ties him into the incredible time period there in the 1870s and 80s. Uh, where it got very violent in the state. And uh, anytime there's money involved and power, and I mean, that's just bound to happen. And uh, uh, the, the beef contracts with the army, that, that kind of thing, there was a lot of competition for it. And where there's, where there's money and power, there's usually uh, enforcers and, uh, and he rides along and he comes in at, uh, at that time period. And he was, he was pretty valuable to the, the people that hired him, I guess you could say. But it sort of looks at the, the Billy the Kid phenomenon in, in New Mexico is really amazing where uh, that's one of the things we're known for that and UFOs and a few other things. But uh, we don't want to get too much into Billy the Kid because he was not a rancher. He helped. He was a cowboy. He was more of a gun, gunman than a cowboy, but he was a cowboy. But it, his story ties into this story because it was a really dramatic time in our state's history, our territory's history. And so we're looking forward to that exhibit. It's gonna be very extensive and cover a lot of ground. So we're, we have some objects that we have from uh, the McSween fire there in, in uh, Lincoln. So anyway, I'm gonna stop there and, uh, and we can talk about different things. You can ask me questions, I can try to answer them. And there may be some things I didn't cover that 
Uh, actually, let me jump in here real quick and uh, look at my notes here. I'm going to talk about our events real quick. Um, we have, and we may change some of them, but we have annual events and hopefully we can start having those again this fall. But the next one would be Homegrown. It's called Homegrown in New Mexico Food Show at Gift Market. And we do that the weekend before Thanksgiving every year. And we have usually two or 3,000 people over the weekend, shoppers that come in. We, we showcase the growers in the state, the people that produce the food that they're the, we have salsa, we have uh, different kinds of sauces, candy, pecans, all that kind of thing that are grown in New Mexico. So we showcase that right before the gift buying season uh, begins. So people like to buy things for their families from, you know, from New Mexico, they send back to other places. So uh, in uh, January, we have uh, our antique show and hopefully we can have that as well. We were just, we just expanded it to two days when the pandemic hit and we're just starting to grow that event. So hopefully we can get that going again. Uh, the first weekend in March is Cowboy Days mm -hmm. and that's our sort of our ranching festival. And it's, it's a really strong family event, a lot of kids activities for that one. And then we do our blessing of the fields on May 15th. It's a, a tradition in the, in, the, in the valley here that's gone back generations and generations where uh, the, the, a priest comes out and blesses the fields, blesses the animals, blesses the water and the bread. And we have a group from, from uh, Tortugas that comes out as well and participates in that. So, uh, and then the third Sunday and in, in, oh, actually we were gonna start a new event last year but we had to put it on hold. It's called Fiber Fiesta. And one of our educators is very talented with uh, fiber arts. Mm -hmm. So sewing and weaving, uh, wool spinning, all these different kinds of activities, we are gonna showcase those in, in June every year. That'll be a two day event as well. And then the third, sun, the third Sunday in uh, July is ice cream Sunday. We have our big ice cream event. So, and then we usually have a community appreciation day in August, but we had to put that on hold. We may push it to October where it's a free day. We invite everyone to come out and just that, They'd never been there before or, or people even regulars that want to come out but basically just to see what we have it's like an open house kind of thing so anyway i will i will be quiet now and I look forward to trying to answer any questions you might have or any discussion you want to try uh, david you had a, a question or a comment uh yeah uh, thanks thanks a lot craig for being with yeah us. really interesting uh i'm just curious as to whether or not uh the, uh, the Confederate tie of our region of the state is something the showcase highlighted at all at the Farm and Ranch Museum. Most of the Anglos that uh, uh, you know, were farmers and ranchers in this region during the Civil War were uh, you know, on the Confederate side of uh, the divide. So I'm just curious as to whether or not that story is, is, gets told at the Farm and Ranch Museum. No, we haven't really gone there. Um... That's interesting, especially with the, the way, you know, if you look at last, not this past summer, but the summer of, of 2020, <laughs> some of the things that came up, um, that, that's something we haven't really gotten into the, 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 I wouldn't say politics, but yeah, I guess it is politics. But one thing I noticed driving down Baylor Canyon, I, I guess Baylor was a, a Confederate officer, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really, I'm kind of surprised that there hasn't been, I think there's a, a little bit of something going on now, but I'm surprised there's not more, more people that are that have a problem with that. Baylor Canyon Road, Baylor Pass, all the different things that are named after him. So, but that's something we haven't really we haven't really done. Okay. Yeah, it is an and, interesting history, though, David. I found that since I've been here, <laughs> they were primarily yeah. Confederates. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, my I can tell you about my ancestors. They came from Texas and through the South. So, I mean, I they you know. I'm, I'm the furthest west of, of anybody, I guess, in, in my family. Uh, most of them are still in eastern New Mexico, but they came through. The, my, they migrated through the south over generations, and so I know they were they were part of that as well. Is is there a resident historian at the Farm and Ranch Museum? Yes, we have a history curator. Her name is Leah Tuki, and she probably would have maybe hosted this meeting or at least been at it. But she's on she's on vacation the the past two weeks. But yeah, she. She would have a lot of good knowledge about that. Oh, go ahead. So you're, sort of, you're sort of getting the back up today. 
apologize for that. Uh, go ahead, Annette. Well, how could they have possibly been on any side? New Mexico wasn't a state back then. Well, it's it's a long and complicated history, but the Confederates wanted to have, uh, you know, manifest destiny, you know, uh, held for them too, and they they <laughs> they, they wanted to have uh, control over the entire South Western Swap right. country from yeah. uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast. Oh, so it's not like an official state part; it's individuals that join sides. No, there was that. It was a territory, and the territories were involved. That was they were, you know, a, a secondary aspect of the war between the states. But it's. Uh, I'll I'll be happy to give you some references. Oh, okay, all right. Well, no, I'm. You know, mm -hmm. hey. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, she's she's from Germany. She's not familiar <laughs> with her. <laughs> yeah, we, we yeah we can't we can't catch me up on on history here in the next minute and a half. Yeah, okay. Uh, go ahead, Jack. Jack, go ahead. Yeah, you're uh, muted. Okay. Okay. Now. Yep. Fine. I'm going to say that uh, John Bloom is on today. So John, you can correct me if I'm not if I'm not right. But uh, the newspaper in Messiah, the town of Messiah, was very strong Confederate, and uh, the the editors and the staff of the newspaper during that era was very pro Confederacy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, one of the big aspects that uh, Lincoln talked about is that, uh, well, we got slavery in the South, but we don't want it expanding out West. And that was one of the main reasons for fighting the Civil War is to stop the expansion of slavery. Yeah, slave states, you know. Go ahead, anyone else have a question? Uh, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, uh, you got me really interested in these owls you're you're not coming through real good all is, i knew was sure. there was a pair of owls that were up in the rest of owls or what uh, sorry about that uh, oh, no problem. Are, are they barn owls or are they uh, the great owls? What What's the difference and where do they live? They're great horned owls. Uh, there's a male and female and uh, we clean up after them every morning. Uh, <laughs> our, our maintenance guy, bless his heart. It's just part of the daily routine. I guess we, we shovel it on the south side of the property and then we scrape it off the sidewalk on the north side. So, but there are two great horned owls, and uh, we have had barn owls out in the hay barn before. Uh, our uh, our staff down there discovered them once, and there was a, several babies. So they sort of built, they quit taking hay off of that side and sort of built them a little secluded fort area, uh, and left them alone. And so the, the the museum's been actually very good for the wildlife in the area. You know, but it's just quite an ecosystem on those 47 acres. You see all sorts of things. But yeah, when you come to the museum, just right before you come in the building, just look look straight oh, up. Yeah, right or, right maybe up. maybe stand back a little bit and then look up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jack. Uh, uh, Craig, thanks a lot for spending your Sunday afternoon with us. Yeah, appreciate it. my pleasure. Uh, when school groups come to the Farm and Ranch Museum, is the staff available to be uh, helpful in letting the students know uh, what is there and what they're looking at, or is it strictly up to the teacher to be informed? When we're, when we're fully open and full steam ahead, we have guided tours with uh, docents. Now, a docent could be a staff member, it could be a volunteer, but they're trained and they, they're knowledgeable and they take the kids in groups of about uh, 20, 25. Uh, sometimes we'll have 100 kids there at once. We'll have four groups going to different stations. Uh, they stop at the dairy barn or they take a ride around to see the animals, that kind of thing. But yeah, we have docents that give the guided tours. We're not allowed to do that right now uh, because like I said, the state is very cautious with us and uh, sort of like the schools, uh, but they, 
once we're allowed to do that, we'll have docent led guided tours again. Right now, the, the groups that are coming out are just sort of looking around on their own. Thank you. Anyone else? VJ's got a question. Oh yeah, VJ, go ahead. You gotta open up, VJ. <laughs> No, I did not say that. <laughs> oh, I okay. put your hand up on your on your uh, screen, VJ. Sorry. Oh no, that, you're you're coming through now. No, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, I'm. No, I did not have a question. I know there's a quilter also, and you have had quilt uh, quilts exhibited. Uh, are they permanent or are they? Uh, uh, sometimes you have quilts and other times you don't. There's two, there's two uh, quilt cases on the north end of the building, uh, just across from the Peter Hurd charcoal study. And uh, we rotate those quilts every few months, I believe. Uh, and then once we get that fiber event going, that textile event going in June, uh, there'll be a lot of quilting and quilts there at that event as well. Oh, okay. And, and we have had quilts. Yeah, I think down in the, in the arts hallway, uh, the south hallway, I think we had a quilt exhibit down there once. But we have two in the north hallway that we rotate. Okay, great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes. Uh, as the time goes on, uh, Craig, are you going to have, we, they used to have a lot of uh, speakers come in out there, uh, you know, in your lovely um, auditorium. It's really very good. Uh, yeah, I'm, really, yeah. I'm really hoping we can get back to that very, very soon. Um, they're not letting us have events with a lot of people right now. So hopefully very soon we can get back to it. We didn't do the online uh, lectures. I wish we could have. We were we had a few people that moved on to other jobs while we were closed and we were sort of short staffed, but we hope to get back to that. Uh, we've had uh, cowboy poets, we've had authors, we've had artists, uh, we've shown uh, videos and movies in there. So yeah, we want to get back to our culture series. That's what we call it. And it was, at the, it, when, when it comes back, it's probably going to be in the daytime. It used to be at 7 p.m. on Thursdays, but I think it's going to be a day event when it comes back. And hopefully that'll be this fall as well. Yeah, I used to have a lot of uh, interesting speakers from all over the state and uh politicians and everything. Yeah, I, a lot of different people. We had the National Weather Service guy here in town come out and talk about the weather. That was really interesting and and Chautauquas and a lot of different things. So that, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Uh, I just want to commend you on that, uh, having come from a different part of the country that exhibit that's been permanent there for quite a while. I'm talking about going all the way back uh, to when the Spanish came in and all the way through up until, I, I especially like in there uh, because I'm old enough to remember when we had Sears and Roebuck and, and uh, that sort of thing and, and uh, that, that little area where everything was gotten out of the catalog. <laughs> it, 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 it provides a memory. <laughs> I remember catalogs too. When we, when we take the kids through that part of the gallery, it's the mercantile and it's, it reminds me where I'm from. We had, uh, the post office was on one end of the little store in the town of Dora, New Mexico. Uh, the post office was on one end and they had canned goods and, and different things. They had catalogs there. And so it reminds me of that. But when we take the kids through, uh, we tell them this is what Walmart looked like a hundred years ago. <laughs> it's, it's sort of mind blowing to them. And they, the whole catalog thing is, especially with shopping online now, it just seems so different to them, but the kids really get a kick out of that, that exhibit. Yeah, <laughs> but it is, that whole, that whole area goes all the way back to when the Spanish came here, all the way up until, you know, recent history. It's, it's really well done. Thank you. Yeah, we, a lot of talented people uh, have worked at that museum over the years, and especially the builders, uh, just, just really great skill. Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead, uh, Jack. Go ahead. I, I, I don't have your name. Uh, uh, Craig, what is your title, and and what was your path that brought you to that uh, position? 
You said you were a journalist, right? Yeah, my title, uh, I think the official state title they have for me in Santa Fe is Public Relations One or <laughs> something like that. Public Relations A. Something I, so I've gone by communications manager, uh, public information officer. And then I think now my card or something, it says public, uh, public information slash media relations. So I work with the media quite a bit and that's my background. I, uh, I, I grew up in Eastern, Eastern New Mexico on a wheat farm. And uh, I didn't wanna, as much as I admired farmers, including my dad and my grandparents, and I wasn't gonna be what I was gonna do. <laughs> I, got a, I got a little too bored on a tractor all summer. So uh, I went to Eastern New Mexico University and man, man, uh, majored in journalism and then got a job as a sports writer here in Las Cruces in the eighties. And so um, I worked there and moved over to the new side and did some editing and some page layout. And, uh, you know, it, I, I enjoyed a lot of that, but when it became an afternoon paper, or actually a morning paper, we, uh, I would go into work at about 1 p.m. and work till about 6 p.m. and then go home for about an hour and eat dinner and see my family, come back and go home at like 1 a.m. Uh, we, we, we would run the press about midnight and uh, had two small children at the time. And I, you know, I just, I wanted to do something different. And of course I'm in the newsroom. So I keep hearing about this farm and ranch museum that's coming. And once I saw the scope of it, how big it was going to be, I was thinking they, there's going to be some jobs there. And that's, that's, I love agriculture. It's, it's in my background, it's in my DNA. And, uh, you know, I, so I volunteered there for several months and sort of got my foot in the door. They knew who I was. And I know John, I see John Bloom's name on there. He's a volunteer as well for many years there. And I sort of got my foot in the door. And um, when they had a position come open for that particular job, I was able to get that. So that was that was 21 years ago, 22 years <laughs> ago, like that. So I've been there ever, ever since. I remember we had a, a meeting among staff back then. It's like my second or third month on the job. And it was one of those things where they have all the staff there and they, everyone talks about sort of like what I'm doing right now. Uh, where you want to be in five years? What, what, where are you from? What, what's, you know, and I remember telling them I'd like to retire here. <laughs> so that's so much I like this place. And, uh, and uh, there was a few, you know, laughs around the room, but I, you know, what, I'm almost there. I'm not... <laughs> so anyway, that's how I ended up there. Annette, you had a question or a comment. Oh, yes. Um, I was wondering, you know, you you said when uh, Vijay had a question about the quilts, uh, that you had uh, things in storage that you then rotate. Um, so besides the artifacts that you rotate out of your own storage, you know, like usually museums do. Do you also exchange your exhibits with other um, farm and, you know, ranch museums that might exist around the country or in other countries? Yes, we do some, some sharing of artifacts. Uh, we have about 12,000 objects in our collection. And, mm -hmm. you know, vast majority of them are, are back at storage. Uh, where preservation takes precedence over everything else. Mm -hmm. So when we do move something out, we, we try to rotate it and it, it takes, you know, it, it sort of extends the life of it. But we have exchanged uh, uh, artifacts with other museums. Uh, we had a cowboy exhibit a few years ago that most of, you know, we had our stuff, but we got a lot of stuff from the History Museum in Santa Fe. Uh, they, they sort of loaned us a lot of things. So uh, more recently, uh, the Dressed for the Occasion exhibit, which is where the Home on the Range exhibit is now. You might remember Dressed for the Occasion with the dresses and the undergarments and everything. Oh, yeah. a, lot of that, uh, a lot of that came from the Silver City Museum, and they loaned us those, and mm -hmm. we sort of tag teamed with them on that exhibit. So you do see a lot of this. Yeah. But that seems to be more regional. That's yes. That's kind of stick more regional. Yeah, the, the, the thing I can think of that came the furthest was when we had a saddle makers exhibit. It's, that, the exhibit was actually called Legends in Leather, and it wasn't just saddle making, it was leather, leather crafts as well. 
But uh, one of our esteemed volunteers at the time, Slim Green, was a renowned saddle maker. And uh, he donated his entire workshop to the museum. And we basically built his workshop inside the gallery. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in that exhibit was a leather nameplate he had made for President Franklin Roosevelt uh, in, the, in the late 30s, I believe, or maybe early, early 40s when he was in the army and uh, stationed in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And that nameplate, leather nameplate was at the Hyde Park Museum, I believe in, uh, in New York. And so we were able to get that and have it in that exhibit. So that's, that's something that wasn't regional. But that's about the only one I can think of that didn't come from, you know, fairly close. Mm -hmm. But what a neat thing that was to have. Yeah. Anyone else? Question, comment? Charlie. Uh, Charlie, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry my audio is so bad, but um, That's fine. some of us were talking the other day about uh, Coco Ross and the uh, precipitation out here. And uh, I, they said uh, you would be coming on and you're the guy to ask. My question, are we really different from the U.S.? I missed part of that. Did anybody else catch all of that? Well, he was talking about, what are you talking about, uh, weather? Try one more time. Yeah, the, the spottiness of the rainfall out here. Uh, is that unique to us or is that pretty much throughout the U.S.? I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that. <laughs> uh, I, I grew up in a family where everyone is looking at the sky all the time. I mean, it's it seems, yeah, it seems different for sure. Charlie, that was a that's a different speaker who's coming up later. We're going to have yeah, that's Dave Dubois time. next week. Yeah, Steve yeah. Dubois. Yeah, he's going oh, to that's... come up next week. I'll talk about him later. So. Yeah, I uh, that's who I was talking about earlier. He's he's came and spoke at the museum. Uh, there in our, our theater a uh, time or two and and uh, I'm actually talking to him now because we uh, he's got these webcams situated in different places out near Lordsburg where they can keep an eye on the on the dust storms and that kind of thing so we want to have a webcam as well maybe one of them we might point at the owls so people can see the owls <laughs> 24 hours a day so I'm right. talking to him about the technology what we need to do technology wise to uh, have a webcam at the museum so so we have been talking to him. He's 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 going to be a, a great great guest for you all. Oh yeah, he's he's going to be our speaker next week, next Sunday. Uh, do, 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 do you keep rainfall information over there? How much rainfall do we get in the last short time? You know we do. We have a weather station there, and it belongs to uh, the tech. The computer part of it belongs to KVIA in El Paso, Channel Seven, ABC affiliate. And, uh, but I, I'm not sure it got all the rain the other day because it looked like it was off to me, but uh, yeah, for the year, I think we were like seven, I wanna say seven inches or close to it. Oh. Maybe for this year, mm -hmm. which is pretty good, so. <laughs> but yeah, we yeah. have it there. As long as it's, sometimes it goes offline, we have to re restart it, but it's it collects uh, information there. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Bloom. I'll speak up if I may. Am I getting through? Yes. Looks like yeah, I'm, go ahead. I'm flattered uh, that my <laughs> lurking here was uh, noticed, and I apologize for it, but that's the way I feel today. Uh, <laughs> I want to com commend you, Mr. Massey, on your review of the development of this wonderful museum here, which uh, my wife and I had the pleasure of seeing from the original right. uh, groundbreaking to its uh, development to a really important facility. Uh, I'm hooked in on the state history program through the State Historical Society. And I can advise you <laughs> that you'll be involved in uh, publicity for an event in April of next year when the State Historical Societies of New Mexico and Arizona will have a joint meeting at the Front Ranch Museum. Well, we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to that. And thanks again, John, for all your hard work. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Uh, go ahead, Carol. 
Do you still have history lectures? When I first moved here, it was suggested to me that I take the class from Joe Tice Bloom. And uh, it, it meant a lot to me because I was from a small town and just kind of laughed at the idea of farms being a museum. <laughs> Oh, nice of you and too. I really learned to appreciate the museum, but also I learned the history of the area from Joe Tice Bloom. That is something that we, we certainly miss. We miss Joe so much, yeah. but that's something that the museum misses as well as uh, we, we're, we'd love to find someone that can, that can take that role and, and teach a class because it was full every year. You know, she would teach it in January, February, and March, I believe, mm -hmm. or at least the first two months of the year. And uh, the class filled up every single year that she taught it. So that says a lot about her and about the, the need for something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, very much so. Is anyone else? We're getting well, close to I'll, the I'll oh, ask a ahead, question. Donna. Yeah, I, I, got, I got on a little late, Craig, but thanks for being here and talking to us. Um, I'm curious about Adobe Hinge and that project of our cartoonist. I, I, want, I want to know if you know anything about whether that is going to be built up above the museum there and if that's on target for, and, and whether there'll be access through the museum if they ever build that or. If, if I don't know what the status of that is. I, I haven't heard anyone talk about it in a long time and we changed directors and I'm not sure what our new directors has been told about it or how she's been briefed or anything, but uh, if, if and when that does happen, yeah, um, we will certainly be uh, connected to it somehow. What, uh, what is this from? Phys physically? <laughs> I don't. Tom might know more than I do, but it's. Uh, <laughs> uh, is it Bill well, Divin? Bill, right? Yeah, Bob, it's Bob. Bill. Bob Divins is Bob he? Divin. He's our cartoonist in the Sun News. And and it's his vision to build a kind of a Adobe. Um, recreation of Stonehenge or a interpretation of Stonehenge above the museum to the north between the water tower and and the museum and people can use it for meditation and photo ops and weddings is that right Craig those yes. kinds of things yes that sounds right yeah I, I just don't know where it stands and it's been talked about for a long time and that land belongs to the Bureau of Land Management Ooh. and uh, so they're, they're involved and there's been talk about, you know, hiking trails and all that kind of thing. So yeah, I really yeah. don't know what's going to happen there, but that's something to watch in the, in the future for sure. Well, if there's no one else, let's give uh, Craig a big hand. Hey, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you very much. It's, it's very go, informative. Well, thank you. Hey. I thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, it's a real asset to the community. It truly is. Uh, the Farm and Ranch Museum. Thank you. We, we believe it is too. And we're trying to get everyone else as enthusiastic as we are about it. So it's it's always, a, you know, we're not like Santa Fe where it's a, we have a built in tourist uh, community uh, or a lot of tourists coming through, I should say. So it's, we're still trying to get Las Cruces to understand how great it is. So <laughs> we, we appreciate you all helping us spread the word. Thank you so much. <laughs> No, we're, we're, we're very happy to, very happy to. Uh, well, anyway, next week, we're going to have Davis Dubai. Uh, Tom was suggested him. And with the recent UN climate support and all the things going on so far as disastrous weather reports, from fires <laughs> to God, you know what, uh, uh, he's going to uh, be our speaker next week. And it should be very timely. And uh, we're looking forward to it. So uh, uh, join in with us, folks. And uh, we'll learn about uh, what's going on in climate and uh, how we can address it. So, Great with topic. That, with that, thank you, everyone. Thank I'll you. see you next week. Thank you for Bye -bye. having me. Thanks, Craig. Yep. Bye. Yeah, thank you.